So hi everyone, from wherever you're joining us from, welcome to the Women's Planting Seeds of Change, Stories with Transformation with Jane and Jane. Hanse, my name is Julia Banyak. Um, I'm Niue, which is Cree from St. Albert, Alberta. And I'm currently in my first year at St. FX, where I'm taking a Bachelor of Science in Human Kinetics. Additionally, um, I'm on the women's rugby team, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator today. Um, I'd like to begin by asking Grandmother Jane to start this webinar with an opening prayer. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I, I want to greet you in, in four Indigenous languages and in Indigenous to Canada. And, and the reason is, is Mi'kmaq, which is my own nation, and <clears throat> um, Ojibwe, uh, Anishinaabe, because that's my ceremonial family, adopted family in Manitoba, and <clears throat> Cree because of my adopted Cree uncle who's passed away since, and any Mohawk because of my Mohawk family that, that we've, that have adopted me in uh, Six Nations. So <clears throat> it's Gwe, um, Ani, Tanse, Seiko Skanangoa. Greetings from my heart to yours. I am very pleased to be here today. And I want to begin with a prayer. And what I'm doing is I've lit smudge and it's white incense sage that's in a, a shell. And I, I've lit that and I'm going to share with you why we smudge and how we smudge. And the smudging is to cleanse and to, to purify the air and to purify ourselves. So I begin when I smudge, I begin by smudging my mind. I ask creator, I ask the grandmothers, grandfathers and ancestors to help me to cleanse my mind, to clear it. And then to cleanse my heart and my spirit so that I go into this with a good heart and a good spirit always with the right intentions. And then I use the smoke to cleanse me physically. I also ask those grandmothers and grandfathers, ancestors, to cleanse my eyes so that I see good things, my ears so that I hear good things, my mouth so that when I speak, I speak the truth but I don't hurt anybody with my words. And then I smudge the bottom of my feet so that as I walk the earth, that I walk that earth with love and caring and I walk the earth in love. And then <clears throat> because, and I want us to join in heart and in spirit, I'm going to send the smudge your way so that we unite, we become one heart and one spirit because the heart and spirit transcend that physical realm. So I'll begin with a prayer in, in my language. Isuk, Kaniska Mijina, Kuga Mijina, Asa Hawaii, Muwalolek, Uchidolana Agwe, Edamolek, Atkoi Winen, Asiawi Abohan Muye, Laman Menaha, his look at this name, Ula Luwahan Dantel Boalig, a Higinamuya Wanta Hordi, and Siduahan, Axalsudi, a Hamogi in Ordi. Laman Menahat, his woolly adulti this name, a Menahat, his canama dulti this name. I'm said Nogama, all my relations. Thank you, Grandmother Jane. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1726. These treaties did not deal with the surrenders of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq, Maliseet titles and established the rules for what was going to be the ongoing relationship between nations. 
I'd like to introduce the wonderful Jane and give a brief understanding of why we are here today. Um, every year, the Cody Institute recognizes and participates in International Women's Week, including International Women's Day, which happened to be yesterday, March 8th. This webinar is a part of other local events recognizing International Women's Week. I encourage you to take part of other International Women's Week events that might be happening in your community and support women's rights year round. Information about events happening in Antigonish area will be posted in the chat. We invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat as many of you have already done. As this is an international event, it is great to see the diversity we have here with us today. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Cody Institute's YouTube channel. Everyone who is registered will receive an email when it is posted. Um, so we will hear from our guests and then we will have a great, uh, brief question period. So if you would like to pose a question for Jane, just mention it in the chat and we will get to your questions. So today we have um, Jane Mary Meter with us. Um, hopefully Jane Mary Laws will come in. As we said, we hopefully it's just like internet connection issues, but we're praying that she'll come in eventually. Um, so we have two amazing guest speakers that uh, will share their personal and professional stories about planting seeds of change. So let me introduce to you Jane Meter from Unimogi. And we are here to highlight the indigenous stories, knowledge and experiences of creating change. So a brief introduction of Jane Meter. Grandmother Jane originates from the traditional lands of Unimogi, now commonly known as Cape Breton, and resides in Member Toon, a Mi'kmaq community. She is dedicated to preserving and promoting Mi'kmaq heritage by working with people and organizations to keep the language alive, often layering her language, lessons, and cultures and ceremony. As a pipe carrier and spiritual teacher, she has taught at Santa Fe University and Cape Breton University, where she, re where she specializes in indigenous education, cultural responsive pedagogy. She's also the elder in residence at the Circle of Abundance at the Cody Institute. Welcome, Grandmother Jane. Please share a bit about yourself. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and and uh, as was said, I, I come from the traditional lands of Winnemagi, but I live in a community called Mambutu, which is just outside of Sydney. I have, um, I'm a mother of five children, one of, um, we, one who lives in, uh, they live all over the place. One of my, my youngest lives in the Yukon. I have one living in Alberta, um, one in Manitoba, one in Halifax, one in Truro, and one here. And, and um, one of the young women that I, I would, that I called my daughter, and which my daughter was done to a traditional adoption uh, ceremony. Um, she lives in Winnipeg. It's not that she doesn't have her own parents, but we did a traditional adoption ceremony to invite her and ask her to join our family um, along with her son. So ceremony has always been very, very important to me. It, it is what has given me life. I, Sundance, we've been, my family has been Sundancing for probably about 22 years now, 23 years maybe. But it is, and going to the ceremonies, going to pipe ceremonies, sweat lodges, um, ancestral ceremonies, school stands, all those big ceremonies and, and connecting with our people in small ceremonies is what has made my life worthwhile. And I don't know where I would be without that, without ceremony. I don't know where my family would be, but it is because of that ceremony um, that we are able to, to be a family and to um, show affection and love. I mean, we did that already, but maybe more so because of ceremony. We, we've become much closer in following our traditional ways. Um, <clears throat> I, I went back to school when I was older. I'm old now, but I went back to school when I, I was uh, in my late 30s and, and uh, graduated. I, I began with going to uh, taking a, a teaching certificate from McGill University, then went back here to CBU 
Cape Breton University, got my undergrad there and got my, um, my bachelor's in education and my master's in education from St. FX. And I'm teaching those two universities now. And I really enjoy that. I'm, I've been widowed now close to probably 20, just trying to think, 26 years and have raised those children as a single mom. I hope that gave a little bit of information. <laughs> oh no, that gave us lots of information about yourself. Thank you, Jane. That was very, very helpful. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you if you would share a story that highlights a significant time for Indigenous women's leadership for community development and learning for change. Well, a story that, oh my God, there's so many things to like, like uh, I guess right now, now is a good time for young women because I find that a lot of indigenous people, in particular indigenous women have been hurt by the Indian Act, have been hurt by colonization. And we come, from a matrilineal, matricultural uh, society. We, as Mi'kmaq, we are egalitarian. We are an egalitarian society. And women always had a place. Our women, um, we had say over who we were. We had say over our own children. We owned our homes and we owned what was in the home, which was something very different when the Europeans arrived. And so <clears throat> we always had that, um, I guess that, that freedom as women. And there were historical writings that talk about the Mi'kmaq and in those historical writings, um, there's a quote that says the Mi'kmaqs, foolish notion of suffrage, oh no. So we, um, so I think it's important now because our people, not just our women and our young girls, but our young men too, and our older men who stand beside us and have supported us all this time are beginning to realize this is the way it was pre-contact. This is where the women were pre-contact. And there's a story too that one of my uh, dear friends tells, and it was a story that her mother and her grandmother had um, passed on to her. And it's a story that talks about the coming of the Europeans. And I guess one of the, um, they knew when somebody had a dream and they knew that the Europeans were coming and they knew, they said the, they understood that the Europeans were going to hurt or kill the leadership. And it just touches my heart because the story says, so the men stepped forward and they told the women, we will protect you. We will say we are the leaders. And that way you're protected and that the real leaders can hide in plain sight. And so, I, I think that's such a beautiful story of love and, and protecting each other. But I think it's important now because some of the things my daughter and a few of our friends are doing now is we are taking the young women who are eight to probably 16 years old and we're starting to put them through puberty rights through those rites of passage that have not been done for a long, long time. One of my daughters is now 31, <coughs> excuse me. And when she had her coming of age ceremony, she was told by her grandmother that the last time that they had anything like that in public was when her grandmother had her ceremony, which was well over a hundred years prior to that. And so now we're giving that opportunity to those young women to become those women warriors, to become those leaders, to be involved in politics. 
by bringing them from that girlhood to womanhood through ceremony. And I think that's so important. I think those ceremonies are important. And I think it's important to bring um, those young women to, um, in, in that way, to give them that life because right now when we look at ceremony, when we look at rites of passage in in the society that we live in in Western society, and what are they? We look 16 years old, you get your license, which is good. 17, 18, you graduate from high school. That's good too. 18, 19, you go to university. 19 years old, you can drink. 19, 18, you can vote. 19, you can drink. 19 years old, you can buy um, pornography. And at 19 years old, you can also buy weed legally. Not that those things are terrible in and of themselves, but it, it's that we taught our children that those things are okay. We haven't given them a real, um, real ground to stand on and something for themselves. So to me, these ceremonies are really important. And that's why we do these ceremonies for our young people, for our children, so that they can um, become those beautiful young women. And as far as we are concerned as Indigenous women and things that my daughters talk about, it's not to shame them when they're on their moon time or going through their menses, because that's one thing that fine society is doing, is shaming young women when they're on their menses. Whereas with us, it's a celebration of womanhood. It's a celebration of, of that feminine, that feminine, that divine. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Yes, that was very helpful. Um, I would like to ask you to elaborate on something. Um, for those that might not know, you said ceremony is important. Why might ceremony be um, important in like our culture? It, to me? Yeah. To, or to me personally, it's important to me personally because it, it gives me guidance and I find like, for instance, my daughters, we, we work together and we do traditional naming ceremonies with, uh, with people. And I find that when we do that traditional naming ceremony and we tell people the name that they have received through that pipe or through spirit, what happens is it gives them identity. First of all, it lets them know who they are. Secondly, it also gives them a place who they are and where they are and why they're here, purpose, right? So it also makes those relationships and those connections. So your connection to creator, or if you don't want to, if you don't believe in creator and God, then that power that is greater than ourselves and that power can simply be love. So it's our connection, our relationship to that power, our relationship to each other, as human beings, our relationship to the animal world, our relationship to plant life, and our relationship uh, to the earth. And it, it grounds us and helps us identify who we are and to give us that purpose. And so those ceremonies, what they do for me is they feed the soul. They feed that spirit within us. And, and it, you know, when it doesn't always have to be ceremony, but it could be different things. Walking along the beach and watching those waves come in, that's soul food, that feeds your soul. A, a walk in the woods and, and seeing all those beautiful trees, that's soul food. So anything that feeds your soul in ceremony does that for me too going into a sweat lodge, it feeds my soul. And in helping other people, that feeds my soul. That's, that was amazing, Jane Meter. Um, so to continue, do you have any inspirational words to share with our viewers about seeds of change? 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe a hard question, but. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm just thinking like the, the seeds of change and what has helped change me is, I guess it's, it, there have been so many, um, excuse me for, for the noise in the back that see, it's going on lunchtime and they have the carts going up and down the hallways in the school. That's the noise you hear in the background. But I think one of the biggest um, things that helped me and that transformed me and that helped me um, change, I guess, is, is as I was saying, 20, 26 years ago, going on 26 years now, uh, my husband was murdered in our community. And uh, I had, my children were all teenagers. Um, they were 19, 17, 16. And my youngest, my two youngest were three and five. They were just babies. And I wasn't with him at the time. And not that I didn't love him. I still loved him very much. But because he was um, addicted to alcohol, he is an alcoholic. And he, um, I could no longer live with him because of his violence. I asked him to move out. And I didn't want him, uh, I didn't want that violence around me. One, because I didn't want my daughter thinking it was okay to live like that. Secondly, I didn't want my sons to think it was okay to treat women like that. <clears throat> so I asked him to move out and I wasn't with him. But that week that he died, the week before, I had this very strange dream. And in that dream, I was like watching a, um, a video, like a, watching a movie taking place. And it was like on stage. And I, he was there. And, and then something happened. And everybody that was there died. And I watched him. He, he came and he took a seat at the corner of the the room on the side and I was the only person in the audience and this voice told me don't worry about him he's safe in my hands and I, I thought that's such a strange dream the following week he was he was murdered within in our community and I think some of the, the things and that, that's when I realized change begins up here it begins up here and then it comes down here to the heart and to the spirit. But after he passed away, I remember being in my room and I remember praying and, and talking to creator. And this grandmother appeared in front of me and she said, okay, Jean, she said, now comes the time you have to make the choice. You have to decide whether to forgive or not forgive. But she said, I'm going to tell you this much. If you do not forgive what lies in the future for your children, she said, they will become bitter, angry adults. But if you choose to forgive, they will become loving, kind human beings. And she said, the choice is yours. But she said, the other thing is, yes, this man took their father's life but you have the power to destroy it if you choose not to forgive. And so she said, ultimately that decision is yours. And at that moment, after that grandmother spoke to me, I realized I have to forgive. And no, I didn't always feel it in my heart and spirit, but I knew I had to up here. So I acted as if I had already forgiven. I acted as if there was you know, that the anger was there and the hurt, but I acted as if I already forgave. And it made such a big difference for me. It made a difference for my family. It made a big difference for my community and praying for that human being. And eventually that forgiveness came. No, we're not best friends, but I also don't let that resentment and anger destroy me. And I, you know, and, and I still pray for that human being. And I'm glad that things are going good for him. And he's back in our community. And I, you know, to me, his daughter is absolutely a beautiful young friend to my daughters. So 
those are some of the things. And to me, change begins up here. Then you take it to your heart and spirit. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. That was really inspirational and just shows how strong of a person you are. Um, now, Jane, Mary Ross is here with us. So I will do a brief introduction of her and then I will ask her some questions. I'm very excited that you were able to finally join us. Um, so we will begin with Jane Mary Ross. Uh, Jane Mary Ross is the director of the Samburu Women Trust in Kenya. Jane holds a Bachelor of Arts in the Community Development and an undergrad in Gender Development. She's a Community Development Practitioner, Feminist, and Human Rights Defender for more than 20 years, advancing women and girls' rights among Indigenous communities for policy development, governance, and implementation. Jane Mary Ross, will you please tell us a bit about yourself if that did not <laughs> finish everything? Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for introducing me. My name is Jane Meruas. Yes, I'm a very proud indigenous woman. I'm a feminist. I'm a mother, uh, as well as a mentor for more for young girls and others indigenous women, uh, not just in Kenya, but even globally. Um, hmm, how do I begin? Do I give about my personal story or what? Is there anything you'd like to share about yourself? Just give us a bit of knowledge about who you are and like why yeah. you chose to do this. So, so, so basically being an indigenous woman uh, and coming from a patriarchal society, which believe that uh, girls cannot go to schools, girls are second class citizen, boys have more privilege than girls. So basically, personally, I was not to go to school initially because my dad did not believe in girls education. Uh, besides that he had many cows, many goats, he was a rich man. And we were two in my family. Myself is last born and my elder sister. Unfortunately, my elder sister never went to school. He was married off. And because my mom was a bit tough and he said, uh, my young daughter is not going to go to get married off. So my dad said that, then in that case, he's going to look after my goods. Of course, uh, I was looking uh, after my dad goods when I was around 10. And then by good or bad luck, the hyena ate 10 of his goat. And because the goat were many were almost more than 100. So the other side of the goat I could not see because I was young. So when I came in the evening back home, uh, my dad was not happy. And he decided that I look like I'm a useless child because I could not look after his goat, which is part of his health. And he said that the best thing he could do to me is maybe to donate me to a Catholic school. And that is now the turning point of my life. Uh, because my dad said that you can go there and stay there. When I get a suitor, maybe I can for you. And from there, that's how my life turned around and I went to school and I've never looked back. Uh, when I was in form two, roughly when I was around 15, my mom passed away. So he never saw the benefit in fighting for me as a child, as a girl who believed so much in it, go to school, may uh, soul live in peace. But um, I had a meeting with myself and I thought, okay, now what next? Uh, of course, my dad do not believe in girls' education. It means that uh, my education is going to end. And I approached the priest who is currently still alive and told her the story. And I asked him if when the school closed, I can do some manual work around the, the Catholic uh, mission, then when the school closed, I can do it with the other kids going to school. And he looked at me and he asked me what I can do. I told him I can do anything as long as uh, I am safe. And when the school closed, I go back to school and he pay for my school fee. So he told me because there was um, a huge shop for women, some of the women empowerment, he told me that you'll support these women during holiday to 
sell some of the shop? I said, yes. So basically, when kids were going to home, I could live uh, in the mission for almost two to three weeks or even a month. Uh, then I went back to school. Then I finished my high school. And then I uh, saw that I was a bit uh, very focused girls. And he said that immediately after school, what do you want to do? Then I told him, if I manage to pass and get some great good to the university, I would love to go to college or university. By good luck, uh, I managed to pass. So immediately after my cases, I stayed like almost four to five months. Then uh, I joined a private university in Kenya and we paid. And because already I had already made uh, the decision that I want to change my narrative. So I never look back. But in between, uh, when my mom passed away, because we come from a very polygamous family, uh, the brothers to my dad had a meeting and they decided that they won't remarry my dad uh, because they believe that if a woman dies, a man has to remarry. And because also, unfortunately, we were two girls in a community who do not believe that if you have girls, it's like you don't have, you, you, you don't have nobody unless you have a son. So they told my dad, because already you have two girls, then it means your lineage is going to die. So you have to remarry so that you get a son, so that the, your name continue. So they trying to push him. At one point, uh, after school holiday, I was called. Then I didn't know where they were calling me. So I was told he wanted to go back home. So I told the father, let me go and listen what they want to say. So I went, there was um, a meeting of uh, uncles to my, to my dad who had like, it was like 15. So uh, they asked me, uh, the reason why we called you, it was straight to the point that we, we want to remarry your father. And already we have identified a woman with a child. And my, my dad was a bit old because he was roughly around, I think almost 60 was a bit old. So I asked them, so why do you want to remarry my dad at his age? Maybe he might not going to have kids. If you marry a young woman, why are you pushing him? He said, because uh, first of all, he's rich, he has cows, he has goats. So we need to remarry him so that there's continuity of life. And then I told him, what about me? They said, of course, you're going to marry. So you, there is no continuity if you're there. So I told them, OK, that's fine if the decision is made. But I told them, but I know my mom had some goats and cows. So can you give me some of his share? so that I can take myself to school. Then if my dad married, then he continue with shares with the other woman. So they were a bit reorganized and they told me, will you think about it? So my dad, and I told him if my dad married off, then it means that I'll also move away, so I'll not come back. So my dad said no, uh, because my first daughter was married off and I don't want to be linked with my only daughter. So I'd rather not to get married. I'd rather stay and wait when she finish school. So they said, no, where are you following? Uh, what the girl is saying, no, we have to push you. You have to stay here. Unfortunately, he took his ground. So he never remarried. So I went back, I finished. I finished. When I finished university, I got the first job uh, within the Catholic mission, which was part of women empowerment. I was taking through women, supporting them uh, around civic education, making them understand, making them understand how do we do business? How do we save money? And by then I started now earning my first salary and I went back to the village and brought my dad. And I told him, because you're old, now I want to take care of you. As much as you never believed in me that I'll become somebody in life, I want you now to stay with me so that the rest of your life when in this, before you transit to the next world, I'll take care of you. So the brothers were a bit respectful. I told him, no, he's old, I'll take care of him. It was a bit urban and you know, it was not comfortable coming from the village to the, to the urban center. I told him, I'll take care of you. So we stayed with my dad, uh, like roughly two, five years. Uh, then I move away. I started now um, doing the work of women. And that's now we registered around issues on some trust. Initially it was Swedo. And initially I did know that when I was a young girl, I was fighting for my space as a young girl, defining who I am and trying to see that, you know, this is what I want in life. And I made sure even my dad passed away, may his soul rest in peace. Whenever I was going to the meeting around issues, supporting women and girls, having conversation, I could go along with him and make him give out the story to the larger community. The reason why I was doing that, I wanted him to change other men who are radical like him. 
so that young girls like me who nobody believe in it could have an opportunity to go to school and they could become human being like me. So I could go along with him. After I finish the meeting with the women, I'll say, who doesn't know my dad? Of course, everybody knows that because I come from some of, most of those villages. So I told them, I also have my dad here. So I want him to tell his story about me and the way we are with him. I was using him so that somehow he changed the narrative. And by good luck, somehow, some of these stories change slowly the narrative of most of, uh, of the families believing, of course, the girls can achieve, a girl can break barriers, and a girls can be, change education. Because initially, when we are going to school, we were like the testers. Some of, of the community we come from, they could say, let's see the daughter of so, if she's going to finish high school, if she'll translate to the university, if she's not going to get pregnant, if she's not going to fail. So we were doing like people were testing on us because it's like they never believe that a girl could achieve anything. So some of these stories made me who I am today and me, made me believe that I can go back to the community and make sure that those women who live in isolation, those women who live in some of the areas that is difficult to access, some of those women could also change the narrative and decide that one of our board of trustees, who is actually an indigenous woman, she has never gone to school, but with the traditional knowledge, she could not sign all right, but uh, working with her like three to four years, she could now sign, she's one of our trustees, and she could sign checks, very comfortable. That's one of the success that you tell people that these are board of trustees, can she sign, then they look at you. No, she cannot sign because she doesn't know how to write. So these are some of the things that slowly we are changing the world. These are some of the things that they are not documented, but these are the stories that we want our children to learn and believe that yes, nobody should make you nobody and you should change yourself so that other people can learn from our stories. These are some of the stories that we are using to make sure and making those women who have been subjecting around issues on gender-based violence, around issues on discrimination. Of course, to the community we come from, women own nothing. You become like the slave. That sometimes even when you reach that time of the month that it's, you have your you know, monthly periods, that you cannot even ask for $1 from your husband to buy the sanitary pads because you own, you don't have anything. So we also want to change small narrative that even those women, you also believe in yourself that somehow your stories can change. If you take your child to school, they will come to change the narrative in your society. So these are some of the story and also trying to champion the campaigns of sponsoring girls to go to school. I believe so much that you empower a woman, you empower the society. When you give a girl a chance to go to school, of course, she'll never depend on anybody. She doesn't become a slave and she run away around issues of gender-based violence. Most of all, she'll have that dignity and have freedom to choose. This is what I want and this is not what I want. So basically, this is some of the things that I champion and, and believe that even if I'm not here today, but there is that continuity of life for those small lives that have changed in my own small way. Thank you, Jane Mariwaz. That was very inspirational. Um, so I'm going to continue. And firstly, I would like to remind the audience that anytime you have a question, just pop it into the chat or the Q&A box. If it's for a specific Jane, just mention which Jane it would be because we do have two Janes here. So, um, so I'm gonna continue. Um, with the life experience of educating yourself and working for change, Jane Meter and Jane Mary Ross, if you had the opportunity for a wish list to create a space for intergenerational and international exchange and learning for all indigenous women, what kind of items would be on that list? Let's say the sky's the limit. Jane Meter, would you please um, tell us what be on that wish list first? Of course, one of, is it me? Go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, of, course, of course, one of the wish lists that I would wish, uh, of course, all of us women, either I'm black, you're white, all of us have that commonality that bring us that we are women. 
despite the color. That if all we can have cross-cutting culture and exchange so that we can learn, you know, different knowledge and document that women from Africa, indigenous women, Latin America, you know, Asia, all of us are common. How do we bring that commonality we have and strengthen that women and document uh, our knowledge and we can share to our coming generation. Some of these stories that we are talking, we can share to our generation to come. I think that is one of the wishes that I'll have because if you have that unity as women, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and document our stories and share us the same platform. I think that's one of the wishes that I have. Thank you, Jane Mary Ross. Jane Meter, what would be on your wish list? My wish list, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't cost anything. My wish list for women and children is uh, to be respected, to be honored, to be loved, and for women and children not to live in fear or violence, and <clears throat> for them to be to understand what beautiful gifts they are to creation. And I think that's one of the big issues we have with ourselves and with others, is we do not realize the, um, the divinity in each other, the beauty in each other, and, and that, um, that we are all of infinite value to creator. And, there's a quote that I, I really like by um, Orville, Chief Orville Looking Horse, who's a, from uh, the Lakota people. And he says, you are put in this time and in this place to personally decide the future of humankind. Do you think you were put here for something less? And I think when we start to, to think about the power we all have within us and the love that we have within us and, and to treat each other with the utmost dignity and respect, that's my wish. That's a long list, <laughs> but that's my wish. Not a long list at all. I, I genuinely agree. So while you still have the mic, um, what would be the best way and proper time to celebrate the success of women in your communities? <clears throat> Anytime. <laughs> Anytime at all. And like with us, we have uh, moon ceremonies where we honor that grandmother to us. She's a female entity, that grandmother moon, that grandmother, grandmother water. Um, and we, we work with those entities. And, and I think that that's the time that you, uh, that I think we can celebrate those special times with women. We also, like I was talking earlier about those puberty rights, after the girl has gone through one year of preparation and she picks um, part of that ceremony, she picks four women. I guess the closest would be like godmothers or mentors and not necessarily mom, but could be aunties. And sometimes with us, aunties isn't always a blood relative, but could be mom's friend or, or somebody that they adopt. And so they pick these four women and we go through that ceremony. They go through that ceremony with them. And they know that these four women commit make a commitment, offering of tobacco and gifts, and they speak to each other. And they, there's a commitment that they will be there for this young woman, whether it's through, through uh, when she goes through um, like dating and, and through university, schooling, um, marriage, children, whatever is going on in her life, they'll always be there as her advisors. And I think we have to kind of open that door for our young girls because mom can't always be there or mom, maybe sometimes young girls, they don't wanna to go to mom 
but they have these other women. And, you know, to me, that that's really important. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that young girl coming into womanhood. And it becomes a community celebration. That's another big celebration we have for women. That was very, that was very informative. Um, Jane Mary Wass, when you think of celebrating women in your community, what would you like to see happen that has never happened before? And when is the best time to celebrate women? Uh, thank you so much. Of course, uh, celebrating women in my community, uh, I celebrate them every day because these are our mothers. These are the women who walk for distance looking for water. Uh, these are the women who are managers of home. They wake up from 3 a.m., sleepers at midnight, making sure that everybody is possible and nobody appreciates them. So appreciating them every day to me is what I value most. But besides that, I think uh, to celebrate a magnitude of women uh, from the community I come from, the best time is when there are rains, their season when it is raining, because this is the season that it is calm, everybody is happy, uh, plenty of milk, uh, there are livestock at home, it is green, plenty of grass, it's less conflict. So it means there's a lot of stability uh, at home and women have peace and lesser work. And this is the time you'll have women to celebrate to them, talking to them, giving them their aspiration. Uh, and, and even giving them hope, some of them even who have lost hope. This, these are the times that you celebrate, especially that it's time for rain and the animals are back home, when there are plenty of milk and it is green. Because uh, the community I come from, we value so much milk, it's, it's a sign of peace. And grass is a sign of who we are as human beings. So you hold both grass and milk and poet as a sign of peace and prosperity. And to me, that is part of unifying factor as us as women. Thank you. Thank you, Jane Mary Ross. Both of you have mentioned every day, women are to be celebrated. And that sounds amazing to me because women should be celebrated every day. Um, so thank you for gifting us with your time. Uh, it has been an absolute memorable experience to moderate, um, to continue. The anti Ganesh International Women's Week 2022 organizing community um, decided on the theme of seeds of transformation, feminist organizing change for growth and for change of and growth in consideration of the changes, past, present, and future for women's rights, the gender justice and ending patriarchy, and the women who do this work, recognizing the ordinary and extraordinary women who work for and seek change in communities and nations. Today, we have brought together two phenomenal Indigenous women, both named Jane, from different continents, both committed to change for women, families, and communities. Thank you, Elder Jane and, Jerry Ma and Ma Jane Mary Wass, for sharing your stories of change and transformation with us in recognition of International Women's Day and Week. We are grateful for your dedication and transforming minds, hearts, communities, and building peace, justice, and equality. So now we will get to the question portion. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat or the Q&A and we will get to them. Um, we have a couple already, so I'm just gonna find some. Jane Mary Wass, do you feel safe and secure in your community? Of course, uh, being a woman uh, and being a very vocal woman, sometimes you feel unsafe, sometimes you feel safe. Uh, Yes, sometimes you feel threatened. Uh, people even go extra ways, but when you believe in yourself and believe in your work and the community you work with also believe in the cause that you are advocating. Sometimes rally behind your cause. But also as a woman, you also have to be very careful and training very careful because some of these things that it's not safe, especially where you go in an environment is not safe. Uh, there's no network. Uh, and also with where insecurity, everybody's owning a gun. Uh, sometimes it's also a couple lot of questions. So somehow you develop uh, different strategies on how you engage different people 
different age, age set, making sure that everybody is comfortable and everybody understands the issue, especially when you're challenging uh, the cultural norms around issues on discrimination, around issues on where women in inclusions and patriarchy in the society does not go well. Some of our uh, brothers and fathers are with us in the society. So they find that that one become more threat. And maybe when you are pursuing more to their women to change their mindsets so that they also become like a threat to them. So somehow you need to come up with different approaches and different strategies so that you make sure every conversation, everybody understands the same elders, women, girls, young people, so that somehow you navigate and you are safe and deliver the message to the best of your ability. I don't ever answer the question. You did, you did, don't worry. <laughs> um, so this one next is for Jane Meter. Um, how are they maintain? How are they maintaining their traditional ceremony to young generation in this technological world? Um, <laughs> first of all, we get away from the technology. Um, we've had to use it during COVID. We've had to do talking circles um, through Google Meet. But I think part of the big thing is that um, we talk, we sit in a circle and we talk to each other and we guide these young women and, and young people. And we tell them our own stories. Um, we give them traditional teachings. And usually we go to a place, we'll go to the teepee or we'll, we'll sit out on the land or where, wherever we can. And we begin with a pipe ceremony and prayer and smudging and bringing us together. And it could be a moon ceremony. It could be the sweat lodge. It is those places that we, where there is really no technology and we bring them there. And that is when we start to feed that spirit, start to feed that soul, start to feed the heart and that mind, but because, you know, I find Western society, we're always talking about the, the mind and the, um, the physical, but we forget about the emotional and the spiritual part of us. And so we try to um, make those young people feel welcome, make them feel loved, and, and just make them feel very, very important because they are and to help them realize, yes, they are gifts and that they are, um, we learn from them too. I've learned many things from children. When I was telling you earlier about my, um, when my husband died, I learned a lot from my children. My daughters were three and five. And at that time, I called the mother of the other, another, the, other, the man who killed my husband. He had a daughter who was about seven years old. My daughters were three and five. And I called her up and I asked, how is your daughter doing? She said, she's really not well. The kids in school are being difficult. They're giving her a hard time. They're telling her, you're no good. Your father's a murderer. You're, you know, you're, you're just not worth anything. And, and anyway, so I, that evening, I sat down with my daughters and I told them, there's a little girl who's having a really hard time. I said, her father was the man who killed your, your father. I said, she's having a hard time. And the kids in school are really, uh, they're just giving her a hard time. And she, she's sad. And uh, so my three-year-old said, well, why don't we go visit her and let's bring her gifts. So we went shopping, we went to this flower shop and my five-year-old got these, uh, this little teddy bear with an angel, a halo, the wings. And my three-year-old, my mom, and she and my mom were in the car and there were students going around selling chocolates. So they bought a box of chocolates. Anyway, we went to see this little girl and we, we um, and I, I went with my oldest daughter who was 19 at the time. And we went to see the mom and, and the little girl wasn't home yet, but the mom said, she knows you're coming. She knows who you are and, and she's, uh, she's on her way in. And I kept thinking, how do I bring this up and without, um, without 
hurting this little girl again. She's gone through enough and I, I don't want to, to cause any more damage. And so she came in, she saw my daughter since the first time she met them. They all hugged, they gave her the gifts and they were sitting down on this coffee table and talking and she was sitting in the center and my three-year-old was sitting to her left, my five-year-old was sitting to her right and they were all talking and kind of looking out the window and they just kind of, um, my three-year-old simply asked her, she said, your dad killed our dad, didn't he? She said, yes. And then she said, where is your dad now? She said, my dad is in jail right now. And then they just leaned into her and my three-year-old told her, we know you love your dad just as much as we loved ours. And it was so emotional and just so powerful. And that gift from, from those children and those beautiful teachings, just by watching them. And they, you know, and they all hugged. And to this day, we're talking 26 years later, they are good friends and they support each other and they stand up for each other and they are close, you know, through that tragedy, this that happened. But the blessing is they are, they're, they're like sisters. It started with sadness, but it, it's, you know, it, it's been a beautiful relationship for them. And I, and I think those are things that are important. So when we start touching people with the heart and with the spirit, you know, we, we touch those hearts and spirits. And I'm a teacher by trade. And I think to me, that's important. And, and I often tell my students, I don't remember what the teacher taught me. I remember how the teacher treated me. Those are my favorite teachers. And I think that's, how we, that's what we need to remember. As human beings. Okay. I 100% agree. Um, so this next question is for both of you actually. So what is the most important seed of change message you want to say to young girls? Uh, Jane Mary Boss, if you want to start with this one. I think uh, one of the key messages for young girls, adolescents, girls, uh, girls of age who, have married, who are not married with children between zero to 20 years, the key message that, uh, or something to give them hope is that one, believe in yourself. Two, nothing is impossible if you believe in yourself. Uh, three, there is nothing which is as hard as you believe in yourself. Have conversation within yourself and say, put very clear roadmap on what you want. And also don't mix with influencing of bad companies because somehow they disrupt your dream. Work with the people who believe in your dream and people who are very positive in life and always have very positive uh, and also have very key self-esteem in life. I think those are the key things for young girls who are coming to believe in themselves. Thank you, Jean Mary Walsh. That was very, very informative. And it's going to help me, I would dare say, in the future. Um, Jane Meter, how would you um, relay a message to young Indigenous women about how seas of change might be important? I think the seeds of change begin within us, within each of us, in our own hearts, in our own spirits and in our own minds. And it's about having faith in ourselves, having faith, I think in humankind too, that we can change and so can humankind. And I, I think it's, those are things that are really important because that's what gives us hope for the world. You know, yes, there were terrible things happening in the world today, but I think, <clears throat> It's also, we still have that, that hope, always a better future for our children, a better future for, um, for our grandchildren. 
Mm-hmm. And it, and I know with, with us as Indigenous people, we're always talking about seven generations. And we look seven generations back to see where we've come from and, and seven generations ahead to see where we're going. And always to remember that what we do today affects those seven generations that are coming. And that we need to always be mindful of, of our responsibility to humankind. It's not just about us. We are doing it as well. And I think that's what it is. It begins with the mind. Yes, I can change this. And then you change with your heart and your spirit. Oops, I was accidentally muted. Um, (laughs) The whole Zoom thing. Um, So the next one is for Jane Mary Ross. Was there a time when you wanted to give up? What kept you going to change this narrative? Of course, uh, there's no one time that I wanted to give up, no. Uh, Because from the onset, of course I said from previously that I went to school by chance. And when I went there, I had a very small meeting within myself. And I told myself, if I go back, of course I don't have space, respect the fact that the home that I was born. And it's not that they are poor, they're not poor. It's not that they don't have resources, they have resources. You see those two different things. It's only that they didn't believe in the cause that uh, other people believe in uh, as a young woman, as a young girl, so that you can pursue your dream. So that one itself, keep me going and keep on motivating me never to look back until I achieve my dream. And I'm happy that today I can proudly say that uh, I talk with confidence and challenge the patriarchy and support every space of every young girl, every woman to make sure that uh, they've seen the dream that I've seen personally as the Midwest. Thank you. You have tremendous strength. Um, what are other effective strategies that can be used to engage men as, as perpetrators in our society? Um, Jane Mary Watts, would you like to address that one first? Of course, there are many ways that you involve, not just with men, uh, but people, we also have some women who don't ever believe the cause that we are jumping in. So you need to bring every exit, elders, opinion shapers, youth, and bringing them the conversation and let them understand and believe in the cause that we are jumping in. Because once they internalize and understand the concept, it become easier for them to support our idea. But as long as it's women who have the idea and support the cause, that one also changes the narrative of bringing insecurity and conflict within the family. And the reason why sometimes men do not support our cause is that we don't bring them in the conversation. Bringing them in the conversation helps us change the narrative, especially to the communities I come from, which is female genital mutilation is very high. It's happening up to now. Early forced marriages is 100%. So there is a need to bring everybody on board, making elders who are the custodian of the culture understand the impact of not taking girls to school, the impact of forcing girls to marry off at tender age, and the impact of not giving your wife or your daughter to have that voice. So it should be wholesome. So bringing them on board and making every space and every voice understand. When all of us have collective understanding, it becomes easier for us to champion the same cause. So some of those are some of the strategy, making sure that men and those people who oppose you understand better and they become your ally. Very true. Very true. Jane Meter, would you like to address how men can be an asset um, as we can use them to engage into? I don't know how I can add to Jane's. That was such a beautiful answer. (laughs) I love what she said, but it's like she said, though, it's part of making them that process, right? Bringing them within that in that process. Otherwise, it it won't happen. And, And one of the things that I encourage our our women to do and our mothers is to bring up those sons in that loving, kind way. And that, you know, they need to um, 
learn to love and, and to be kind to. And, and I, you know, when I look back and when I look at our own history of First Nations people, First in, the Indigenous people, when you look at the greatest warriors within our culture, those warriors, it wasn't about what good fighters they were. It was about how did they care for the elders? How did they care for the children? How did they treat other people? Did they respect them? Did they treat them, like I said, with the utmost respect and dignity? And I think that's how we need to bring up our young men and warriors. And that way they too can affect the older men, you know? Much like Jean affected her father. Like our children, our young people have say and have influence. And I think that that's really important that we, we give those children, those young men, those young women, um, that power to be able to influence their families. The way I was brought up, I, I find it funny now when I look back. I was brought up in the 1950s. And I did not know that other girls' fathers um, didn't do the stuff my dad did. My dad worked beside my mother. He did laundry with her. If she was working, he would do the laundry, he would do the cooking, he would do the cleaning. I thought that every father did stuff like that. But I guess he, he was more open-minded, but I often... And, he didn't have um, issues showing emotion and tears. And I often tell people it's, it's funny because I don't think that anybody that knew my father would not say that he was not masculine or manly, but he was very, very much that man and, and, and a role model for men. Um, and, and it, it, it was because he also, he was brought up by women and he, and I think it's important, um, like Jane said, that we bring them in and, and that we also teach them those, what are usually, or what we call women's traits of love and kindness and of the heart. And yet we teach our young girls to, to be strong. Like we need to teach a good all-round age. Oh, what a beautiful baby. <laughs> you have there, Jean. <laughs> anyway, thank you for, for listening to me. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm guessing that's the conclusion for that question, Jane Meter. Um, so we have one more question for you. The anti-concept, is that new or is it historic? Also, are you aware of any effects in Canada to utilize these ideas of non-Indigenous girls too. It seems that there's a vast knowledge that there could be used to reduce stress, anxiety for all teenage girls. I think it can. And I think the, the biggest thing is, is being honest with those girls and be teaching them with, with a lot of love and kindness. And as I said, you cannot, I can't put enough emphasis on keeping their dignity intact and respecting them. And I and allowing them to speak their minds, to speak their hearts. A lot of non-Indigenous groups use our traditional talking circles. And that of course is sitting around in a circle and passing either an eagle feather, a talking stick or a stone and giving everybody the opportunity to speak. Um, I think another way that I teach my own students and I, I tell them to, to, this is um, something I said that you can do in the classroom, and I think you can do it with young girls. Is I tell the teachers one of the things you can do in the classroom is give each child an assignment every week, and that assignment is to um, take one child, and that those other children have one week to find good things about that child, to write good things. What are their qualities? Why are, why, why are they important in your classroom? You know, sometimes young kids on the fly will write, oh, you're a good ball player, you're a good hockey player, but it doesn't say anything about the character. 
Whereas if you're given a week to think about it, okay, you're a good hockey player because you're a team player. You don't have to take all the credit. You can pass the puck to your friend who will score and it's just as meaningful to you. And if we can do things like that, take that week, write something beautiful. And what I do is what I tell the teachers, both native and non-native, get a blanket that is to be used only for this purpose. Smudge that blanket, wrap it around the child so that they understand that they are wrapped in love and in caring and that there are people around them. It's like being wrapped in the arms of love. And each child in that circle tells that child that's in the blanket, that is wrapped in the blanket, what beautiful human beings they are, what gifts they have offered to the class or to the world. And every week a different child is picked and they have a whole week and you let them think about it. And so that reduces the bullying, that reduces that, um, you know, that competition of I'm better than you, looking down on people when we can see all their qualities. And I, you know, I, I hope that's something that people will use to, to uplift each other and to uplift each of those girls. That was awesome. That was really like, informative. Um, so I do want to give you both a chance to connect to each other. So if you have questions for each other, I now offer you the chance to Jane Meter, Jane Mary Ross, ask each other questions and just Jane, yeah. Jane, if you have a question for Jane Mary Ross first. Trying to turn my mic on. <laughs> So, no, I, I just found her so fascinating. I could have listened to her much longer. And I really want to thank you uh, for sharing your story. And uh, all my love just goes out to you. I, I think you're one of my new friends. And I, and I really love um, hearing you. And I would love to share contact information with you so that we can talk to. But thank you so much. Mary Ross, do you have a question for Jay Meter potentially? Oh, we can't hear you. I don't, I don't know why. It says you're muted. No. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, personally, uh, I don't really have a question, but it's more inspiring uh, to, to speak in the same platform with, uh, with a mother, a Nendli. Uh, because this is where we tap the knowledge as indigenous people and pass it to the other generation. And I'm happy that she's continuing to do that to the young girls, to the other women, and making sure that uh, some of this knowledge that we are, we are sharing, that other indigenous women are so tapping. So to me, it's a honor. Most of the platform that young young women, young girls that we are sharing, but it's really an, an honor uh, to share the same platform, listen to our story, very inspiring. And it, as well as even her shaping the conversation to us young women. So thank you so much. And we don't, even don't take for granted for the people who also give us the opportunity, the university, taking your time, organizing us and bringing us on board. People can listen to our stories. And somehow it might touch somebody and change the narrative. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today in this webinar and for the questions. We appreciate you for your listening, learning, and encourage you to celebrate International Women's Week in your communities and year round, more specifically, because we just don't want to do it this week. Um, I've had an amazing time. I've actually had to hold back a couple tears because it's been really like really inspirational listening to both of you. Um, learning from both of our panelists today and just the two Janes in general, this webinar has offered sacred words and just has been all around inspiration for everyone, myself included. Um, 
I'd like to just say a little thing that reminds me of this webinar. So like dream as though you have nothing to lose, believe as though nothing is possible, love as though your heart knows no boundaries, live as though there's only today. Like just reminds me of both of you and just how you both live day by day and just inspire everyone. And I'd say that's a wrap. Thank you both so much. Aladio, Ichi Miigwech, and Yao. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Thank you.